Hey everyone. Welcome to Who's Guarding the Guardhouse. I'm Elizabeth Hora. I'm public archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Chris Merritt to the program today. Chris, there he is. Chris is the State Historic Preservation Officer for the state of Utah and an expert in historical archaeology. He has led a team of archaeologists at Fort Douglas as they used ground penetrating radar to determine the locations of buried fort buildings and landmarks. Well, thanks everybody for joining. So this was kind of an idea that um, I've been noodling on for a while and it might be unsatisfying to some of you because we are still in the process of analyzing some of the materials that were recovered a few weeks ago. But this is kind of in honor of International Archaeology Day, which is an international event celebrating archaeology worldwide. And so Elizabeth and I pitched like a sort of preliminary report on our actions out at Fort Douglas. So I'm hoping to give you a little bit of background on what we did, why we did it, um, and kind of where we want to go from here, which to me is the true exciting part of this story is like, where are we going from here? Um, the title comes from this little mysterious building foundation that we were able to identify with the help of some consultants of where was the original post guardhouse for Fort Douglas. And so who's guarding the guardhouse? Well, right now, the landscapers at the University of Utah are because it's nicely protected under the sod of the Stillwell Field at Fort Douglas. So I always am a long talker, so I like to do my acknowledgments right up front. And so I just really appreciate uh, the SHPO team uh, that came out and helped me uh, do the test excavation. Uh, University of Utah's historic preservation planner, Charles Shepard, for getting us all the permissions. A big shout out to uh, Dr. Ken Cannon of Cannon Heritage Consultants. And also I see Houston Martin on here. Thank you too. Uh, they, they donated a lot of time and, and effort to help us identify this feature. Uh, the public lands office of so the governor's office, uh, Chris Cramless, the archaeologist, he spent both days out digging with us. So I, I appreciate Flipco's support. Of course, Bo Burgess, who's the director of the Fort Douglas Military Museum for you know, helping us with some logistics out there. And then finally, uh, Ephraim Dixon, I think is also on this call. Uh, without you know, the amount of work that he's done really pulling together the history of the fort, um, I would have been working with a lot less information. So a lot of the historical information I'm gonna to provide today about the guardhouse actually was from an unpublished document by Ephraim. Um, but we're in great communications and hopefully next year, Ephraim will get you out here and we can go play. So for those of you who aren't super familiar with Fort Douglas, I just want to give you a real brief uh, overview. And this, there's entire books, there's entire sessions, there's entire lives that have been uh, dedicated to the U.S. military history in Utah. I am by no means the expert on all these things, but I think it's important to kind of put this in context. Why was Fort Douglas even established here in Utah? Well, we really recycle back to the 1850s with a lot of conflict between uh, the federal oversight, because Utah was a territory at this time. The territorial governor was Brigham Young, who also happened to be a theocratic president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So that created tension uh, internally here in Utah, but also with the federal government. And so there's tons of research on the Utah War or the Mormon War, uh, Johnson's Army is another way we talk about it. But ultimately, because of this tension and a worry that Brigham Young was not going to respectfully um, pass power to a non-LDS, non-Mormon uh, territorial governor, there was a request that uh, President uh, would send army out to make sure that there wasn't going to be a Mormon rebellion. And this became what's called Utah War. But what's really cool about this is that we had almost one third of the standing U.S. military in 1857 marched to Utah uh, to make sure that there was a transition of power and also with these worries of a Mormon rebellion. Uh, this war, this little military action was pretty close to our first civil war in, in North America. So we can't understate it. The picture on the right is actually, this is an Echo Canyon. I was lucky enough to go up on Division of Wildlife Resources Managed Wildlife Land and actually document a bunch of these old fortifications that are up on the Rim Rock in Echo Canyon. Uh, these were built by the Mormon militia in, as the U.S. Army approached because the Mormons were also very distrustful 
of what the army's intentions were. And after all the persecution in Missouri uh, and the fleeing to Utah, there was just this tension, like what was the army going to do? So the Utah war was really this cool guerrilla warfare, but no shots fired. Um, and the U.S. military arrived in Salt Lake City in 1858, um, and it was kind of a whole hullabaloo about nothing in the end. But what that did do is establish the first permanent military post here in Utah, and it was Camp Floyd, which is actually west of Utah Lake uh, down in Fairfield. And if you've ever been to Camp Floyd State Park, great. If you haven't, go visit. It's a cool little place. Uh, but for four years, this is where the U.S. Army had its main military post. And so during this time, they were keeping an eye on the Mormons, but also protecting overland trails, um, interacting with Native American tribes in the region, and basically creating this base of operations out of Camp Floyd. With the outbreak of uh, the Civil War in 61, suddenly that whole third of the U.S. military had to go back. And actually, a lot of the soldiers at Camp Floyd, kind of some went back to the Confederacy, some went back into the Union. And so Camp Floyd became under the control of uh, or jurisdiction of Colonel Connor, who had created a little volunteer regiment out of California. The U.S. Army put him in charge of Camp Floyd. He didn't really like it out there. And so in October of 1862, they established Camp Douglas, which is where Fort Douglas is today. It had the name Camp Douglas until 1850, uh, 1878, and then it was redesignated at that point. So that's kind of a broad overview of why the U.S. military was here. But during this period, especially the 19th century, the U.S. military was in Salt Lake Valley overseeing uh, this still tense relationship with the LDS population, but also interacting with the tribes. So where is Fort Douglas? Some of you might be calling from out of state or you don't fully know. Some of you have probably spent maybe your entire life in Utah and you still don't know where Fort Douglas is. Shame on you. You should go visit it. It's awesome. Um, so here's an 1891 sort of bird eyes view of Salt Lake Valley. This is looking to the north. You see Antelope Island out in the far left. Uh, the capital would be where I marked it. And Fort Douglas is over there on the east side uh, of the valley, and they created this huge military reservation over 10,000 acres that was given to the federal government um, to create Fort Douglas. So that kind of orients you. It's now kind of perfectly surrounded by the University of Utah and Utah's uh, University of Utah's Research Park. But if you've been ever up to the Red Butte Amphitheater for a concert, you're in Fort Douglas, effectively. Um, as we narrow in, uh, Fort Douglas is just this amazing historic resource. Um, it was listed to the National Register of Historic Places in 1970 because of its you know, great importance to Utah history, but also national history. That was recognized in 1975 when it became a National Historic Landmark, one of Utah's, we still only have 14 National Historic Landmarks. And this created this higher level. This is like one step below a national monument or a national park. Um, in the late 80s, there was all this reconfiguring of U.S. military bases across the country. And so at this point, a core of the Fort Douglas military reservation was transferred to the University of Utah. But when that occurred, they were still required to follow federal law in the protection and management of those cultural resources, largely that built environment. The archaeology, uh, we knew it was probably there in the 1980s. But by the time we got to the, the Olympics in the early 2000s, that, that nexus of federal law to protect cultural resources intersected with our um, interest in the excavation and the development for the Olympics. So we learned a lot about Fort Douglas's archaeological heritage from the Olympics because they were required to do some test excavations. So why am I involved? Well, one, we have a role with the University of Utah, with other federal agencies to ensure compliance with federal law and protection of the cultural resources. But I'm just, I love Fort Douglas. It's one of my favorite places in this entire state because you can really walk those grounds and feel like an 1870s military post because the architecture is just so well preserved. And it's this little oasis of a cool historic landscape. My more in-depth interactions came in 2014 and 15 when the University of Utah was doing a huge utility infrastructure expansion project and actually trenched down the street in front of the Fort Douglas Military Museum, which on this map on the right is that gray road uh, vertical on the right side of that map. 
And in that trench, they actually encountered the original foundations for the barracks at Camp Douglas, you know, that were built in 1862 into 63. And they trenched right through all of that. There was a, a big compliance and mitigation project to recover the archaeological materials. But through that project, I really got involved in looking through all these maps. One thing you know about the military, they're pretty OCD when it comes to documenting a lot of the things they do. And so the military had tons of maps. And this one uh, on the right, this is from 1862. Uh, this shows three buildings in the parade ground. I had never even realized that there were buildings in what is now this open field at Fort Douglas. And so this really got me going. As an archaeologist, I'm always looking for places that things could be. You know, the standing architecture, that's easy to see. Uh, but where were things before? And this really keyed me in. And so we approached uh, Ken Cannon, um, who runs his own firm, to come do some limited non-invasive testing on this. But I want to transition before we jump into the results of that in our dig with this. One of the major critiques archaeologists get from some members of the public that feel it's their right to go dig up history is like, well, you guys just go get to dig what you want. Like, not really. There's a lot of hoops and a lot of paperwork filed. So I'm not going to go through this. But in order to do our few test units, we did. Um, I used Ephraim Dixon's historic research to design it. We did some ground proofing. The University of Utah Park Service um, had to review our research design. I had to get an excavation permit from the state to go dig on this land. Um, they had to follow federal law in consultation with all these parties. And then that was one level of bureaucracy. The next level was just interacting with the University of Utah, getting permission to dig up their sod <laughs> in, a, in a field. Thankfully, it was sort of fall break for the University of Utah, but that field, Stillwell Field, the parade ground, is used constantly for sporting teams and cheerleading camps. Um, even COVID, there were still uses of that field. So we had to get permission to do that, tear up the sod, work with landscapers, do an 811 call to make sure we didn't hit some natural gas line. And so archaeologists follow all these rules and protocols to do things appropriately and to make sure that we're managing these cultural resources in the respectful way we can. Because archaeology, we destroy our subject. We dig up a site, it's never going to be the same again. So we want to make sure we follow all the protocols as closely as possible. But there's the bureaucracy of doing some archaeology, which a lot of people don't realize. You can't just go dig where you want. So let's talk about the guardhouse at Fort Douglas. Now, as you know, an avocational military historian, I didn't know exactly what a guardhouse fully was until I read some of the work by Ephraim Dixon. And this was where basically military prisoners were held. So these could be soldiers that were on disciplinary action, um, you know, deserters that were being arrested, um, prisoners that you know committed a federal crime could be held in the guardhouse. And so the guardhouse really is a place for the prisoners and the guards monitoring those prisoners, and then a place for you know meals to be served, and of course, you know, pooping, cleaning, all that kind of stuff that you need in a, a facility. So the first uh, guardhouse was this guy, and it was about 60 feet long by about 18 feet wide, and it served for a while. Um, but by the early 1870s, this guardhouse had been heavily overpopulated. There were way too many people in this guardhouse um, for its capacity. And so there was 58 men in it at one point, and that's not a lot of per square footage. And so illness was very common in this guardhouse. And so it became unserviceable by the early 1870s. Um, so that led the U.S. military to think about what should we do. And so they expanded the guardhouse dramatically. They made it much bigger. And they doubled the number of cells that were in the guard, but it still was less than what the Army wanted. And they reoriented it. That guardhouse, the original one, faced Salt Lake City. This new one faced the parade ground. And you can see this sort of overview map from the 1880s showing the guardhouse in that bottom right. Uh, corner and the face of it is facing still a field with this stockade where the prisoners could walk around in their water closet or privy. So this was really my target was this guy. We know that in 1876 the new guardhouse opened and it operated until 1884 when they closed it again and moved the guardhouse to a different location. 
But after that 1884 period, we don't really have any information on what happened to Stillwell Field. Was it graded? Did they level the building? Did they burn the building? Did they completely dig up the foundations? Obviously, I don't think they did, but those were all questions we had to answer. And so from this schematic um, and from those maps, we did some ground penetrating radar because this is what Stillwell Field looks like today. Just this beautiful, lush, um, heavily watered uh, field. And so you can see the Fort Douglas Military Museum uh, to the south of this photograph. And so it's like, is there anything there? And so I walked over it a couple of times. I did my spidey sense of an archeologist. I'm like, there looks like there's depressions and flattened areas, even in the sod. And so archeologists oftentimes look at that vegetation as a key or as a clue. And so um, I got permission from the University of Utah to approach Ken Cannon, who runs his own CRM firm or private firm, to come out and do some ground penetrating radar. And oh boy, did we score. So Houston, who's on the line, thank you so much because you just put us right on the money with the ground penetrating radar scan. And so in a real layman's term, Ground penetrating radar is the same as how we really navigate planes. You know, radar signals are going out, hitting objects, bouncing back, so we can gauge distance and angle. But instead of going into the air, we point that signal into the ground. And so a foundation, like stacked rock, is going to bounce that radar signal differently than loose, unconsolidated soil. So looking at those patterns coming from that return, we get an output, what's on the right there, which is pretty much a textbook result for ground penetrating radar. We couldn't probably have gotten a better uh, GPR result because that foundation is just so crisp um, or what was suspected to be a foundation. We always have to do science here. So we thought it was. So thanks, Ken and Houston. They came out for free, did this uh, just because they had a passion for the project and wanted to play with the technology. But let's combine the two. So here's the uh, footprint of that guardhouse that was constructed in 1876. And you can see the cells are in the bottom of this photo and then the big guard rooms where they would have ate. And then in the front, uh, there was a tool room and the officer's room. And those walls, when you overlay the ground penetrating radar, I'd say we got a winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner, that's a foundation of an 1876 guardhouse. But, I wanted to really prove, can, can we prove this was that foundation? And so we attempted to now go in and do an excavation. And so finally, after two years of kind of planning, uh, we did a small limited excavation in October 8th and 9th of this year. I wanted it to be a bigger event, but with coronavirus and all that protocol, we kept the numbers low. We kept it largely to my staff and some support from Flipco just to keep you know, everybody as safe as possible, because all I really wanted to do is, you know, is there proof in the pudding on this one? So this is a photo looking to the northwest across Stillwell Field, and you see our little pin flags. Well, that is the extent of that guardhouse. And when you put it on the ground, that was a massive structure. You know, that was 70, uh, 70 feet long by, or 74 feet long by 50 feet wide. That's a big sucker. And so what we attempted to do was anchor that northwest corner and southeast corner of the building to see if like, OK, is it a foundation? Is it in place? Are there artifacts from that period um, so we could learn more? And so we opened up five test units. And so for those non-archaeologists out there, we generally dig in one meter squares. Um, yes, this is a historic period site. They used feet and inches when they built it, but it's so much easier to count in ones and tens and hundreds than tenths of inches and sixteenths of inches when you're trying to excavate. So we typically still use the metric system, even if we excavate a historic period site. Um, we, the deepest unit, which Elizabeth actually was in charge of that unit, she went down about 60 centimeters below surface. Um, that's pretty deep. You know, that's two feet deep or so. Um, and that's where we hit sterile soil. But the cultural material, when I say cultural layer, that's where the artifacts from the period we're interested are appear. We're only 15 to 20 centimeters below the surface. So that means after we scraped that sod off, we were basically right in top of this 19th century deposit, which is pretty awesome. 
Um, you know, we have problems up at Fort Douglas with people metal detecting and we're trying to work with campus police because that actually is against state law. You cannot metal detect on state land and you cannot remove artifacts because it actually could land you a felony for removing those artifacts. Um, so we're, you know, we're really excited that it's there, but it does mean the site is pretty open and sensitive. Uh, we use the screen. So you've probably seen archaeologists with the little sifters. A lot of people call them, but we used a quarter inch mesh just to recover the artifacts. And we collected everything um, with the exception of mortar. Uh, because there was tons of mortar because this rock wall was all cobbled together uh, fairly quickly and with a lot of mortar uh, and coal. The one thing I've learned about Fort Douglas is that these soldiers weren't what I would consider thrifty with their coal. Uh, we found huge chunks of coal, like the size of footballs in some of the post dumps. So they weren't really saving every piece of coal and, you know, like the old Scrooge, like every piece to the, to the nine. Um, so here's an overlay of that ground penetrating radar uh, image overlaid with Stillwell Field on the right. Uh, and so the two yellow squares you see, this is uh, one unit that we excavated and another uh, block. And so we did two one by ones in the southeast corner, and then we did three one by ones in the northwest corner of the building. And thanks again to Ken and Houston for generating this map to give you kind of orientation. If you look at the map on the in, on the right, here's the Fort Douglas Museum today, uh, Officers Row, American West Centers over here, and then Mario Capecchi, uh, Capecchi is down there. So it kind of orients right there. So I like rocks. Rocks are my friend. And when you're trying to find a foundation, you want rocks. And so in the northwest corner, we got pretty much a textbook wall right there. So this would have been the, the northwest wall of the guardhouse as built in 1860 or 1876. Now, it doesn't look that exciting, but that's proof. That's proof that this is a foundation wall and it does relate directly to that guardhouse. And we learned a lot from just this discovery of a rock wall. And then the stuff. Um, we didn't get a ton of stuff, which is OK. Um, we recovered about 100, 100 to 150 artifacts, but the majority, the vast majority, are period to the 19th century. We have amber, olive, and amethyst glass, which is all period to that late 19th century. Uh, we do have square nails, which was the precursor to the modern wire nail when you go to Lowe's today to do your framing. We had square nails before that, and that's all we found were actually square nails, which means that structure was built before 1900. Again, good evidence that that's the building we're looking for. Uh, there was a few pieces of wood we found, probably from the framing of that structure. Uh, Elizabeth, who is a, a wood nerd, uh, she's gonna help us identify the species, if we can, of what wood that is, whether it was locally procured or shipped in, You know, asking more questions of what we recovered. Lots and lots of mortar. Um, it looks like the foundation itself was just this rubble fill, just held together with really dense mortar, which is really fun to dig. Ask anybody when you know that helped us on this excavation using a trowel through compacted clay and rocks and sod. That's great. Your wrists feel so good the next week. And then, of course, we found lots and lots of coal. And it's bituminous. There's two types of coal, bituminous and anthracite. Everything we found at this was bituminous. And I have a real interest in trying to source where this coal came from. Was it being procured locally? Uh, from Colville or, or Carbon County, or was it being imported from somewhere eastward? So we have lots of research questions. Some of the, the cool artifacts is I'm going to highlight two. So we found this one fragment. And from this, and this is all experience, Mike, um, like that's a Jamaica ginger bottle, which is a really interesting part of our history. Some of you have heard of the medicinals. This was probably a you know an eight to ten ounce bottle of up to ninety percent alcohol, but it was a medicinal remedy to cure everything about you. You drink a couple of those, you're going to be feeling good. And this was one of the popular brands of these medicinal liquors in the 19th century. It was so popular that they were still producing it into the 1930s. But because of prohibition, they cut so many other materials and chemicals into it that we get what's called Jake leg. And so Jamaica, Jake, 
Um, by the 1930s, there were so many of these nasty chemicals that some alcoholics who drank a lot of this, they would actually get paralysis in their extremities, in particular their legs. So that wasn't as common in the 19th century brands of this stuff, but by the 1930s, it faded because of just how many bad health effects you had. Uh, but it was, yeah, a little, little tincture. This was right below the West Wall inside the, where the soldiers would have had their little stockade. So was somebody sneaking Jamaica you know, liquor to the soldiers or were the guards out there taking a nip? Who knows? But it's an interesting question. But this was one of the exciting finds. Um, when we pulled out uh, this artifact, we are like, what is this? <laughs> and the first one we actually found was just one of these, um, looks like a bottle bale. It just looks like a little piece of twisted wire. And that's what I thought. It's a, a bottle bale, like an old wine bottle kind of finish. And then we got this tube. Like, well, I don't know what that is. And then we got the tube plus the wire all from this corner unit in the very northwest corner of the guardhouse. So I didn't know what it was. And then we started talking, having Bo, you know, the curator standing right there, plus some other folks that had some military history. They're like, I think that's a, how you fire a cannon in the 19th century. And so, yeah, that's what's called a friction primer. So this copper tube would have been full of black powder. And then in the very top where this pin would be slid in would have been maybe a striker like a piece of flint. And so you stick it in a muzzle loaded cannon in the back after you've loaded it. And then you pull that pin with a string and that strikes it, hits the black powder and then makes the cannon fire. This was this kind of uh, friction primer has been found by the thousands in the American Civil War and battlefields at Gettysburg and Chancellorsville. So this is a 19th century cannon component. And that's pretty awesome. And we found a concentration of these in that northwest corner of the building. So we know from photos, we know from old maps that we do have a lot of cannons on Stillwell Field periodically over the entirety of the post history. So but now we also have pretty good evidence they were firing the cannons, you know, probably blanks. They're not firing actual cannonballs, even though the stories about firing and, you know, having our cannons played at Brigham Young's house. You know, that's fanciful, especially for 19th century cannon technology. But we do know that these uh, were being found in that post. But that's the proof we wanted, right? That's the artifact from that 19th century period that really like, okay, we have square nails, we have liquor bottles. Now we have military material from cannons from the same period. So that was really exciting. So what did we learn? We actually learned a lot from a very limited testing. Um, that one, that guardhouse is under Stillwell Field. That is unequivocal right now. What's exciting about that piece of information is if you've ever been up to the University of Utah, you know that there's buildings and parking structures everywhere. And so it doesn't go a year without someone at the university or someone interested in the university's property say, look at all that green grass. We should develop that into something useful. I like open space, um, but also a fort can't be a fort without a parade ground. It's like one of those true indicating features. So having this as evidence, like not only is there a field that's part of the historic landscape of this district, but now there's archaeology under the ground. We want to educate everyone that this is an area worth preserving. Um, we also learned that 19th century artifacts are just basically below the grass. And that's pretty cool. And that can help us better educate, um, you know, everyone interacting with the Ford about cultural protections. We do know that it goes sterile pretty quick. And we say sterile when we lose cultural material, we go to native soil or pre-development uh, soil. And so that goes about 20 or 50 centimeters, we start losing those artifacts. For the foundation, it is very clearly aligned with that 1876 guardhouse. Um, the moisture from the irrigation made the foundation really hard to see because all that years of heavy watering has kind of mushed the soil and made it more uniform than if it had been a dry landscape. But we can still see it, which is okay. We also, at least from our limited testing, it doesn't look like the foundation had big flagstones or big field stones, you know, nicely dressed rock. It looks like it was largely a, ru a rubble fill foundation held together by mortar. But as we excavate more, maybe we'll find more dressed stones, you know, dressed meaning this formed or shaped. And then the artifacts. 
Um, there are concentrations of artifacts, which is exciting for us. It's not just this distribution of material culture across the entire site, that there are distinct concentrations, like all those friction primers came from one corner. Elizabeth's unit had really not a lot of material culture, but a lot of glass. So I think as we open up more of this site, we're going to see more indications of concentrations. But that means that there's still stuff we can learn. It's not all just mixed. What's the other thing we learned? Most of the artifacts have been pretty much broken down into little teeny bits, um, which is what we call treading. So after this building was removed, it looks like it wasn't buried or was very uh, thinly buried because people walked across it, horses, wagons, and crushed all the material culture into little teeny bits. We didn't find big chunks of anything. And even those friction primers, they're so small that they probably wouldn't have been crushed in the same way. So that means that this wasn't buried intentionally or wasn't buried very deep um, for dozens of years, if not 30, 40 years of people walking and crushing the artifacts. And of course, we do have evidence of live fire of cannons, which is pretty cool. Uh, picture on the bottom right, um, that's that's a chunk of mortar. We collected samples of mortar. We're going to want to do some testing to see what the soldiers were using in the mortar mixture, compare it to what was recovered from the 1860s foundations in front of the military museum. And again, just trying to tease out every small bit of information that we can because we're destroying these sites as we dig. So where do we go from here? Well, this just was that initial test and it did everything I wanted and it was fun. We learned a lot, but now I have more questions. One of the main ones to me is that core of the 1876 barracks, that middle third, is that the original foundation for that 1860s guardhouse? And then it just extended uh, east and west off that. Well, if we dig into that foundation and it has different construction style, different materials, different mortar, maybe they just reused that foundation and expanded it. Um, there was a stockade and a privy or a crapper, if you prefer that term. I do. Um, is that still there? Is that still in place? And boy, wouldn't that be an important understanding of prisoner life? Um, we have recovered really great information from privies of disease and viruses that are still left in the ground from 150, 200 years ago of people defecating. And so that could give us indication of the life history. Were they sneaking contraband in? You know, all these really cool questions um, we could answer from a privy. Um, can we go into the, the rest of that building footprint and discover artifacts that tell us about the cells, that tell us about the officer's room, that tells us about the tool room and the guardhouse? Really trying to understand if there's functional artifacts still in the ground. But we've also focused on one building. There are two other buildings depicted on all these period maps, the army, armory and the arsenal that flanked the guardhouse. Are they still there? Are they still under the ground? The more we walked around up at Fort Douglas, the more we started seeing other little depressions, other little swales in the grass. And that's exciting. You know, we've, we've maybe checked one box that we know the guardhouse is there, but are there other features still there? And we would love to do more ground penetrating radar across a broader landscape, but there's so many, there's so many favors I can pull in from Ken and Houston on surveying uh, when they're a company that needs profit and pay their workers. So we're trying to find money and grants to support more testing and more GPR work in particular. But where I want to go from here is next year, I'd love to do a big public dig. That's what my dream is. I, as an archaeologist, I really feel that tension between most of the public and what we do, that we're elitist or we do it out in the middle of nowhere where no one can see what we're doing and we hide what we do and, and that we're separating ourselves from the public we serve. That's a critique that I feel very strongly because I work for the state. I work for you guys. So I want to get people out on the ground because when Elizabeth's talking to the public as our public archaeologist and we're trying to convey preservation of our cultural heritage, we need to bring them in. We need to have them help us and interact and, and learn how we do it and learn what stories we're trying to tell so we get a bigger group of people to back us up when we want to protect sites or when we want to interpret them. So I want to do a big dig next year, 2021. Um, regardless of the presidential election, 
you know, hopefully coronavirus is under control and we can have a really cool public archaeology dig out here and work with the university, work with military history groups and really have this great public event where we invite the public in to participate in discovering the past, not keep them at arm's length. And that's a passion of mine. And so that's my dream. And so this was step one. Uh, step two is go big or go home. That's that's a good motto. Um, so I appreciate you know everybody's time listening to me today. And I know I saw a couple of comments in the uh, in the chat window, but that's sort of our, our knee jerk reaction of what we've learned. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, we do have some folks who are talking in the chat, and one of them was just me. Uh, mostly complaining that my, my unit just went so deep and it had, Chris is making it sound very nice, had nothing in it. Whitney was in the very good hole. Um, but Ralph was talking about um, that friction primer and he's mm -hmm. like, you know, it makes sense. The gun line was right in that area. Um, so that's nice to have extra confirmation of, of what we think's going on out there. Um, and then Fiona, yeah, please. Yeah. More questions. I'm sorry. Can I make a comment, please. Um, concerning that, those friction primers, remember from 1862 until they stopped using those guns with friction primers. And actually until that post closed every morning and every evening at sunset, that fort fired a gun. Um, and when they were using friction primers, they would fire that primer, that gunner would drop that primer wherever, you know, and it looks like they dropped it in front of the guardhouse while that guardhouse was in use. And it was usually the sergeant of the guard that was the designated gunner for the day. And so that was part of his job. And so that makes sense that those primers would be right there. Just my opinion. Yeah, it, it's Ephraim. No, no, I, I appreciate that, Ralph. So, so Ralph, you're correct. So part of you know 19th century military culture was uh, what's called guard mounts. It would be held every morning. You'd pull, you know, all the troops would fall out into the parade ground and dress uniform. It's essentially the changing the guard, like you'd see at Buckingham Palace, but the same thing happened in the U.S. Army. And so the guards who were on detail at the guardhouse and throughout the post would assemble there, and there would be a, a, essentially a ceremony in which there's a changing of the guard. That includes a firing of a blank cannon. And at the end of the day, as the flag is being brought down at the end of the end, signaling the end of you know the, the active day, again, there's what's called retreat. It's a formal ceremony and there's a firing of the cannon there as well. And that's done by the, the, the guard crew. So the guards who are on guard detail were up until World War II, they were assigned for 24 hours and they were on duty for 24 hours. And they, they oversaw and, and supervised and, and protected the artillery. And then they were responsible for firing the, the salute gun in the morning and the evening. So I would expect that that entire region is just covered with uh, friction primers um, when you get down to it. And if you get a chance to go to the Fort Douglas Museum and you look at the gathering of the um, in the Camp Douglas era and you look at the soldier that has the red trim on and you look at his belt and you think that's a cartridge belt. He's actually a gunner and uh, and the pouch that he has on his belt. That pouch, that's what's in that pouch is, is primers for the guns, because that's his job as a gunner is to carry those and, and stick them in the breech of the gun and fire the gun along with the lanyard. I think that creates a really cool sense of what life was like for people who might have been in the guardhouse, uh, maybe against their will, that every day you just had these loud booming guns going off right next to you. You never had any peace. And other people who were in the guardhouse as well, besides the heavy criminals, were also your drunks and disorderlies. The you know, guys who might have had too much to drink and came in late, they would get thrown in the guardhouse for 24 hours, you know, until they sobered up and their sergeant came and, you know, got them out, you know, but, you know, that was just, you know, where they ended up. The pounding in your head the next morning, though, when they start firing those guns right next to you. That was part of the punishment. When that gun went off, their heads exploded. <laughs> yeah. 
And, and Chris, could I also suggest to you, as you think about kind of your long-term vision, um, I think there's there's an advantage, or there is an opportunity to learn more about archaeology through excavations at military sites. Because the advantage of the military is um, it's a bureaucracy and everything, every virtually every detail of military life is recorded. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for you to look at bigger questions like, so, you know, when they're, when people lose coins, what's you can, you can show the payroll coming in, you can show it being spent out. So how much of that actually gets lost? It allows you to begin looking at percentages that can influence um, how archaeology contributes numbers to you know, other sites, non-military sites, but it's because of this tremendous detail. So there is a guard report book that shows every single day who's in the guardhouse on, on guard detail, who's in the, in the prison for whatever infraction. There are detailed military records for court martials. I mean, so there's all of this, this wealth of detail that you wouldn't normally have for an archaeological site. Uh, and so it's an opportunity to to look at some larger archaeological concepts. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree. And and Ephraim, you, you hit it spot on. There's so much we can learn from these sites. And, you know, it's it's a little unfortunate that at Fort Douglas, this is the only sort of proactive excavation that's been undertaken. Everything else has been related to construction or development projects where where you're not asking necessarily questions, you're reacting to some outside source. And so, yeah. And I'm also interested in the things that we find that aren't on those books, aren't on those ledgers, the, you know, the personal effects, the stuff being purchased out of the supply chain or contraband. I mean, there's just so many great questions. Um, and one of my, my master's thesis, I actually tested a bunch of ceramics that were recovered from uh, the 19th century post dump at Fort Douglas. And I was looking at Mormon made ceramics and looking at the tension between the army and Mormons. And like, yeah, they had Mormon produced ceramics all the way from Hiram up in Cache County that were showing up in the post dump and, and looking at commodity flow of this stuff that's kind of off the book. So. Oh yeah, I could geek out. I could geek out for a long time, and I have such great brains on these cameras too. So, thinking about um, what you might want to do out in the field for 2021, what would the like? Where do you think you might go to excavate? What do you think the goals of that project might be? Yeah, so it it depends. It depends on if I can get me some money. If I can get me some money, that might change where I go big. Um, because looking at this map, you know, I'd like to, to kind of square up our corners, get all four corners pretty well excavated so we know a real true baseline, uh, do some sample inside all the rooms, just kind of get an understanding of the structure and any spread of artifacts. But if we could get um, some additional ground penetrating radar, I'd love to maybe move outside into the, where the stockade was, uh, to where the soldiers had sort of their exercise space and do some testing in that. I mean, that's where Stillwell pretty sharply starts diving off. Um, but I, given what we found in that, that northwest corner, I bet there's going to be really cool intact material culture there that might give us an indication on um, you know, what they're contraband, daily activities, food ways, all this kind of cool stuff. So my focus would be kind of sampling inside the building and then maybe doing some of the open space outside the building. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. Um, hey, Chris, quick question. This is Scott Southwick. I'll come up with a shovel next year and help you out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, with this map here, you said you you dug four locations or five locations? How did you uh, select five units? Those? Five units. How did you select those on this map here? I mean, you had to maximize your time because you you didn't have that much time, or or um, you know, how how did you select those locations? Um, I wish I could give you like a super satisfying answer that I had a divining rod and this is where I wanted to dig. Um, but no, it was uh, I wanted to pick two corners of the ground penetrating radar results. So we could really, you know, ground proof the physical extent. And so I kind of like picking opposite corners of a building because then you kind of have better information on a diagonal of that structure size and extent. So we tried to target that northwest corner and that southeast corner to really anchor the next phase of excavation. And I wanted to try to also drop a unit so we didn't drop right on top of the wall. 
uh, which is a little bit what that first unit in the northwest corner, we came right on top. And so I like to straddle a wall so you can kind of see where the wall is and where it's not, because then that gets you better oriented to the building's location. Um, but now that we know what it looks like underground, we probably work more away from the walls uh, to get better material culture. Uh, but yeah, that's why we picked those two, just to anchor that building's foundation in space. And okay, thank you. And then quick, quick, another question. Yeah. The, the, ground, the ground radar, how much of Stillwell Field did you did you cover? I, I, you know, I know you've got you, you didn't pay for it. It was it was voluntary. But I'm just curious if that's been done or is that something you're doing next year? Yeah, that that's um, this this blue square um, that you see on the the screen right now. That is the only extent of the ground penetrating radar, and um, I think we did three uh, 50 by 50 meter squares. Um, and so if you look at the right, that inset map of Stillwell Field, you can see we only sampled a very small portion of, of the field. And so I would hope um, to go expand, you know, maybe a little farther east and west, or north and south to see if we can see the foundations from those other two flanking buildings. And then maybe down to the west uh, to see if we are hitting any of those features like the privy from the soldiers. Uh, but yeah, we focused on the guardhouse just because there was a really great little flat in the sod and boom, we hit it. So hopefully with money, we can get some more, uh, some more ground penetrating radar out there. But again, I, I can't say enough thank you to Ken and, and Houston from Canon Heritage Consultants for doing this work for us. Awesome. Yeah. And so playing off of that, Haley asks, before you started digging, what was it that you hoped to find? And did this meet or exceed your expectations in any way? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Haley. And, and that's why we did a research design. You know, that was why we write that ahead of time to say, what are my questions? What am I trying to ask of the archaeology? And they weren't really deep questions. You know, I wasn't sitting with a, a glass of brandy picturing deep anthropological questions of the past. Um, it was more like, is there a building there? Um, so our questions were pretty basic. Is the building under the ground? How deep is it under the ground? Um, what was its construction style? Because that would help us better excavate the next round. Um, and is there intact material culture? Because as exciting as a foundation is, if there's not a lot of artifacts with it, there's not much more I can tell. And so our questions were, was there a building there? Does it match the, the foundation of the 1876 guardhouse? Um, what kind of foundation are we looking at and how deep did that go? And then is there intact artifacts, um, you know, concentration, stuff we can learn? And so if those were my questions. And I'd say yes, 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 yes. Um, everything I wanted to ask of this test, we succeeded in. Um, it's It's different. You know, the foundation wasn't as well identifiable as I thought. And Elizabeth's really crappy hole that she dug, um, it was crappy only in the sense that it, it didn't feel like a foundation. It was really kind of unconsolidated and um, not perfectly clear, but that's still information. That is still something that we can help understand um, that maybe that upper portion, and there's also a tilt to Stillwell. And so this upper portion of the building was probably exposed for a much longer time than the stuff down the hill, which probably started accumulating soil and grass earlier. So that upper level might be more disturbed than that back um, western end. Um, so that's a very long winded answer of like, yes, those were what we were asking. And yes, we got information. Not all of it's satisfying. Um, every archaeologist that's on this call has dug a lot of holes at, at the end of the day, like, well, at least I got paid today because <laughs> uh, that was not a very glorious hole. Um, so, but it's all fun and, and we learned so much and uh, it was great. We did have some, you know, people pass by and ask us what's going on and, and the look in their eyes, like I'm on an archeological dig, you know, we kind of take for granted, you know, it's our job, but a lot of the public has this want to participate um, and, and to learn. So, yeah, it was great. One of my goals was to get the public more engaged in Port Douglas, because I think so many Utahns don't understand this national treasure we have. Um, and I couldn't accomplish that, but we, you know, the virus really killed that. Um, but next year we'll, we'll do it. Yeah. 
Um, hey, make me feel better about that that crappy, crappy hole that you had me dig for two days. Uh, tell me about the mortar and what the testing is that you can do on that mortar. Why is mortar interesting? I found a bunch of little unconsolidated chunks. Well, um, you know, anything in, in 19th century architecture is kind of a, a fight between local and imported materials. So we know the stone is all coming out of the sand boot, uh, sandstone up above Red Butte. So I kind of get what that is. But what is the mortar mixture? Because mortar is a mixture of lime and constituent elements like pebbles and rocks and crushed horsehair, any number of ingredients to make mortar concrete. So that could tell us, like, where are they getting this material? Are they ordering lime from local limestone? Like there's that big lime kiln just to the uh, northeast of here. Uh, but I also have heard that the fort had its own lime kiln. I is that what they're using for this mortar? How are they mixing? What are the ratios of lime to other constituent elements? How does that compare to the 1860s foundations? And how did that change our understanding of the chemistry of how to make mortar over that period? That, you know, there's a lot of information out there in the world, but some of those people just I made mortar today, you know, I, there wasn't really a, a written book of how to do that. And same as like plaster chunks, which we didn't get in this excavation, but they did in the other ones, you know, the plaster has the same thing. Like how much horsehair did they use? Did they use straw in the plaster to bind it? Um, there's just, I try to, and, and all archeologists, we try to maximize the amount of information out of every single thing we recover. Uh, and so mortar, it's not sexy. You know, I'm not going to make Smithsonian Magazine for testing this mortar, um, but I can still learn a lot and add to our better understanding of the fort. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you for making me feel better about it. <laughs> it was a bad hole, yeah, but you picked it. So it's your fault. <laughs> yeah, I know Whitney. It, well, is Whitney still here? Whitney was here. I was wondering. So she was in the hole that was, hey, there she is. Um, that was in the Northwest corner. Um, I was wondering if you could just pop in and tell us a little bit about your experience excavating for people who might be out here excavating next year. Oh if boy. So Chris wasn't wrong. Digging through that mortar was a nightmare and my wrist really hurt the next morning, but um, yeah, it was just really interesting to find those. Um, Oh shoot, like the cannon parts and like Chris said, that piece of Jamaican whiskey or whatever it was. Um, it was just really cool. It was just something I wasn't expecting to find and let alone hit the wall. I wasn't expecting that. So yeah. Yeah, if you are coming out next year, I recommend gloves. I don't know if you can necessarily see this big hole in my hand. That's from troweling. <laughs> but she speaks the truth. It'll hurt your wrist. Occupational hazards. Oh, thanks, Wit. Uh, Ephraim asks, where will the artifacts and et cetera be stored? It's a great question. Another great question. So, um, you know, Bo's on here. So we'll be working with Bo at the military museum to take this collection. Thankfully, this year it's it's pretty small. It's a, a couple baggies worth of artifacts. Um, they already have the archaeological materials from Camp Floyd and some of the other excavations that were completed at Fort Douglas. So it makes sense to be retained there. And, and we've been working closely with Bo for years to, you know, start buttressing up that archaeological repository, um, which is thankful. You know, one of the other reasons I was excited to dig here at Fort Douglas is because we had somewhere to put the material of culture. Um, Utah is the only state that currently does not have a repository for historic period archaeological materials. Meaning, you know, I, you know, some of the work I've done out on the Transcontinental Railroad on Chinese sites, there's no museum in the state that would take that material um, because we're a very uh, Native American prehistoric focused collections uh, crowd. And so Fort Douglas gives me that opportunity that it can be put in a repository, meaning it will be open for further study after I'm long dead, um, which is kind of the point of archaeology is I'm using the tools I have today, which were better than the tools 15 years ago. 15 years from now, someone's going to have better technology and they can revisit this collection and do more things than I can. Okay. Um, 
I do have one last sort of question um, because we are hitting around the one o'clock hour. I was wondering um, how can people get in contact with you if they do want to help participate or uh, maybe look at some artifacts next year, um, do some lab work? Yeah. Uh, Thanks, Elizabeth, for that, too, because that was one of the things that Elizabeth and I had planned for this winter was that we were going to do a volunteer lab project at State History at the Rio Grande Depot with artifacts that um, we've been screening from some of the soil that was recovered from the camp dump, um, well, the fort dump, because it was all 1880s into the uh, 19 teens. And so we have just boxes of materials that just need to be processed. And volunteers are great for that because it's you get to see everything. COVID plus an earthquake damaging our building, the Rio Grande Depot, kind of put the kibosh on that for this year. So uh, we'll probably hopefully restart that next fall, um, given the timeline for repairs to our building. Um, But, you know, for for more excavation like this next year, um, you registered uh, for this event. Elizabeth has your contact info card on I'm a public servant. Chris Merritt, cmerritt at utah.gov. You know, feel free to reach out. And when we get close to this event and we do plan to do a volunteer call, we will announce it on our Facebook. We will announce it on some of our other social media platforms of, hey, we want to do this volunteer project. Please sign up. We'll probably limit it who and how many uh, just because you can't have hundreds of people out there. Dean. Um, so, yeah, just keep track of our social media if you don't already. And, and we'll be making sure to announce it. It's definitely not going to be a... Uh, you know, a club. It's going to be an open invitation to anybody. Plus, you know, if you don't want to dig and you want to bring your family up and have us give you a tour and talk about what we're finding, we're going to be there too. That's part of the game. Um, Everybody is available. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, because this is a really unique opportunity and a great one because it's where people live and it's easy to access. Like you said, sometimes we're out in the middle of nowhere and you got to hike in there. So this is great that it's easy for anyone to get out and experience a little bit of what's going on, a little archaeology. So thank you so much to Chris. Um, This was a really cool presentation. It was really nice to see the fruits of our hard labor out there. So thank you so much. Uh, We're all so happy that you're doing this project and that you're finding stuff. And thanks again to Ken and Houston from Canon um, Heritage Consultants. They were a great help. Um, so, so much help. So thanks everyone for showing up today. We really appreciate you taking some time out of your day for it. And we will see you next time. Thanks guys. <laughs>